Hi there, it's Archie and back for the ADT Care podcast. I hope I find you well. Today we have a special guest uh, joining us uh, virtually. We have Dr. Russell Ramsey, who is the co-founder and co-director of the University uh, of Pennsylvania's Adult ADHD Treatment and Research Program. Uh, I thought today we could explore the groundbreaking uh, treatments uh, in the field of ADHD and also look at the practical strategies for managing day-to-day challenges that most adults with ADHD face. We'll be uh, focusing on the research aspects of things and discussing also about uh, psychological treatments, specifically focusing around uh, cognitive behavioral therapy as well, given that Professor, uh, sorry, Dr. Ramsey is, uh, as I said, is a professor of clinical psychology um, and has worked with uh, numerous uh, clients, adults that have um, ADHD. So I'm just going to bring Dr. Ramsey in for a chat. Hello. Hello there. Hey, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you? <clears throat> Not bad, thank you. Yeah, good to see you again. Yeah, likewise, likewise. I was happy to hear your name come up again. <laughs> <laughs> and I've just been doing a, a, an introduction just before I brought you on, uh, and I was just saying to our listeners that it's such an honor to have you coming on as a guest on our podcast. Oh, you're very kind. Amazing. How's your day going so far? So far, so good. It's still at the uh, early part of it, so there's plenty of time for things to go sideways, but so far, so good. Excellent. Perfect. And um, whereabouts in the U.S. are you currently? Um, just outside of Philadelphia in my home. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Perfect. Um, I thought today we can discuss um, quite a few things, actually. So um, just obviously your special you know, specialism in this field of um, adult ADHD and focusing on the treatment side of things as well and looking at research. So I have a list of questions that I want to uh, discuss with you. Uh, I've heard you talk so many times at the uh, different conferences over the years. And uh, as I said, I was quite intrigued to uh, to sit down and talk to you about particularly, you know, focusing on adult ADHD. Um, and looking at some of the research that you you know you've kind of been leading on and just to get your insights in terms of where things are going like if you fast forward in the next five ten years in terms of like treatment particularly so yeah i'll do the sound best. okay for you it sounds great <clears throat> amazing all right so if we can maybe just start with uh, some background maybe if you could just share with us uh, your journey in the kind of special uh, specializing in adhd particularly in with with adults and what was the driving factor in you kind of going into the, in, in this field? There was no driving factor. I bumped into it. ADHD found me. Um, you know, relevant to the background, I arrived at the University of Pennsylvania to start a postdoctoral fellowship at the Center for Cognitive Therapy. Uh, the center started by Dr. Aaron Beck called the father of cognitive therapy. Any, any innovation has many parents, but you know, sometimes we, we hoist somebody up and nobody better to hoist up than he. Um, so I arrived, uh, cognitive therapy, two years of a postdoc. Um, I think I had just been started the faculty track as an instructor. And March 8th, 1999, had a meeting with Dr. Tony Rostein, uh, my future and ongoing collaborator and friend, equal measures both. Um, He had, I'd been put in touch with him by a mutual colleague and Tony is, was and is uh, an expert in child psychiatry and adult psychiatry and a Philadelphia regional expert in ADHD going way back when. Again, I was just at Center for Cognitive Therapy doing, I mean, I I say this unapologetically, straightforward cognitive behavioral therapy for a range of things and which can be very helpful. But Tony brought me in and this is A couple of years after the book Driven to Distraction was published that reinvigorated attention on children with ADHD. And even though there were emerging data a couple decades before, but really put adult ADHD on the map. So Tony said, it seems like uh, a specialty clinic focused on adults with ADHD is in order. And he said, I can handle the medications, but it seems like we would need a psychosocial treatment and a diagnostic protocol. And my line about Tony and me is everything interests both of us and we can't say no to work. So I shrugged my shoulders and said, sure, I'm game. And what I'd say to that is I'm also dispositionally lazy. 
So thankfully, there is very liter little literature to review, so I could get read up quite quickly. But kidding aside, over the years, um, worked together, you know, both in our individual specialties, but with highly collaborative, collaborative, I'm sorry. I have great respect for the role of medications. He has great respect for the psychosocial treatments. Um, and yeah, what be, we, we mentioned that uh, we, or we set that as the start date of what became the University of Pennsylvania's Adult ADHD Treatment and Research Program. Now, Tony left Penn in 2019 to take over a chair of a department at Cooper Health in New Jersey. I left just this past uh, July 1st was my first day in my new venture. So sadly, the Penn program is no more. They, the department decided not to keep it up. But you know, over those years, I think we did, it was a good collaboration. Um, our mission of you know, doing some research, we never had huge funding, uh, but I think we fulfilled that to the degree that we could, um, but also a training mission. And um, you know, Tony with um, being involved with the medication protocols, I think we put together a pretty good um, and augmented by many other people. Margaret Sibley has some recent publications on how do you establish the first assessment for adults with ADHD, and you know, hopefully we contribute a little bit. And then I guess um, if anybody's going to recognize my name, it's probably going to be my involvement with uh, cognitive behavioral therapy for adult ADHD, which was yeah. independently being explored by Steve Safran and Susan Spritch. Uh, uh, Steve was at Harvard at the time. He's now at the University of Miami and has a different line of research. Mary Solanto, whose book is excellent. Um, Susan Young in the UK. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Alexandra Philipson in Germany, Marie Birta. I know I'm going to forget people. I'm, I'm a lumper, not a splitter. I like working on teams. Um, Margaret Weiss in the, uh, in Canada. Yeah. So a whole host of people, but converging all about the same time thinking it could be helpful. So hopefully looking at like the combined treatment approaches for ADHD. So that was my journey. I bumped into it. I, I came to a meeting where it got introduced to me, uh, shrugged my shoulders, said, sure. And to be honest, um, I was thinking, all right, I'll do this for a couple of years. Once we start gathering data, it'll probably be mainly medications. I'm not so sure what the behavior side is going to do for it, but I was pleasantly surprised and continue to be over the years. So I've been learning along the way as much as anybody else in the field and hopefully society in general. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a fascinating thing that, um, Similar to me, like when I, uh, you know, I came from kind of not specializing in, in you know, uh, general, it's more general psychiatry, like what you just said there. When you then come across ADHD, a lot of people do stay in that field, but then usually then go back to doing general psychiatry, doing other things. So it's a fascinating area. So uh, just, you know, given your extensive research and publication history, what would you consider has been the most uh, impactful contribution to the field of ADHD? Oh, wow. I mean, in general or coming out of our program? Uh, coming out of your program. I, you know what, I think at the time it got published 2006. Now it was an open study, not randomized, no controls, our typical client load. And, you know, people, you know, treatment planning or selected um, combined treatment medications with cognitive behavioral therapy or either treatment alone. And it wasn't randomized. It was clinical, you know, people's preference, but most people selected combined. So we had an outcome study. I think it was, I'm going to flip the numbers, either 46 or 64. I'm going to err on the side of uh, the smaller. Um, it was an open study. So both treatments were given at the same time. So we really couldn't tease apart, but I think at the time it was the largest study of adults with ADHD that has since been, you know, and by randomized controlled studies and Alexander Phillips in a couple of years back had the, uh, the largest outcome study of adults with ADHD combined medications um, and uh, the psychosocial treatment, randomized crossover. Yeah, lovely design. Uh, but I think that's the one that we probably have been cited the most. Um, yeah, we had, a, I like, we've been able to publish a couple of st uh, case studies in a journal called Clinical Case Studies, um, which is a nice augmentation of data. Well, you know what? Also going back to the, that initial study, later on, we went back to the five or six people who at the time selected medications alone, and we just ran the numbers, very small study. People met, fulfilled all criteria for ADHD, but generally mild circumscribed impairments or difficulties, work or relationships or school, so generally well-functioning. But we found 
they got better with CBT alone. Now, generally high functioning, and that's also true with the research literature, even with all the outcome studies on cognitive behavioral therapy for ADHD, when they would look at people on or off medications, people off of medications, generally there was no significant differences with people on medications, but generally they would probably be less severe symptoms, milder cases, if you will. So those, those two studies coming out, the case studies, and probably a couple other things you know, out there. Um, a couple years ago, just the role of cognitions in adult ADHD, the role of automatic thoughts. You don't think yourself into having ADHD. So you know, we had a couple of papers here and there that probably hopefully had a, a couple pulse beats uh, yeah, they went on the ash heap. So, when we when we talk about treatment, certainly now we have uh, coaching, ADHD coaching is obviously yeah. quite familiar with that. Some of our listeners might not know the difference between cognitive behavioral therapy or coaching, or not know what what route to take when they want to explore non pharmacological treatment options from a therapeutic point of view. Would you mind just explaining to us the difference between the two kind of treatment uh, modalities there? Right. Right. People may disagree with this because I think it is a fuzzy line, and this is my take on it. So, you know, coaches might disagree with it. Um, so in terms of the, the differences in, in terms of being whatever you want to call them, treatment or support options, because I don't know if uh, coaches would call what they do as a treatment per se, but it is definitely supportive and is designed to make a difference at least with the cognitive behavioral therapy, there's a lot of overlap in terms of the desire to improve functioning, the use of coping skills personalized to the individual, um, and to have the outcome of somebody being, in my line, being able to make informed decisions about what they do or don't do, and to give things a fair shot and personalize the coping strategy. So we might have a way of, or a coach might have a way of presenting a planner or a to-do list. That's why I went like that. Um, but very often the innovation comes from the individual saying, well, that format doesn't work for me, but let me try this. Like an example I just had recently in my caseload talking about the weekly schedule and the planner, the person said, yeah, reviewing the planner Sunday night going into Monday, and we shifted around to say, all right, let's start your week on Tuesday. You've been at work for a day. So Tuesday is where she sort of starts her week, which is a brilliant innovation. Um, but it came from somebody going, yeah, doing it Sunday into Monday. Those are like so lumped together. Let me think about Tuesday as the start of, okay, I'm in my week. Let's get started and then things like that. So those innovations, which I think come from either side. So the differences are, I'd say expertise and training, um, meaning, meaning, um, you know, there are some coaching has credentialing of there's coaching credentials, but it's not yet, at least in the U S a licensed healthcare, uh, position. Like I'm a licensed psychologist in the state of Pennsylvania where I live. And I also have, at least for psychologists, there is this accreditation or this, um, certification, it's called SIPACT. Uh, participating states say, if you have this credential, wherever you live, you can provide teletherapy, virtual care to people in the participating state. So it's like a driver's license for us. I can drive in Pennsylvania, and if my license is in good standing, I could drive up to New York State. Not every state's in, but I think at this point, I'm looking at the map, there's ongoing legislation for some. So there's only about six states in the United States that don't aren't in or don't have legislation to join. So it's sort of becoming a national license for us. So as a psychologist, I'm also trained in, uh, you know, as you probably well know, obviously, but um, yeah, before I ever got involved with ADHD, um, psycho, uh, psychological theory, theories of psychology, psychotherapy, learning theories, um, different assessment, uh, psychological tests, intelligence tests, or research methods, a whole range of things getting my PhD. Now, there's many people who can practice cognitive behavioral therapy who aren't psychologists. There might be licensed social workers, psychiatrists. Dr. Beck is, was, you know, he sadly passed away at age of 100, but was a psychiatrist. Um, and people forget about that sometimes. His, his daughter, uh, Judy Beck, a very prominent cognitive behavioral therapist herself is a, a psychologist. Uh, but other people can practice. And that was part of Dr. Beck's work to say, 
you know, this model can be disseminated and treated to like psychiatric nurses, psychiatrists, you know, whomever. Coaching is its own profession. And actually ADHD coaching started as a, a line in the book, Driven to Distraction, where Ned Hallowell said something along the lines of, yeah, what adults with ADHD need, ADHD need is someone akin to a coach who can provide guidance, suggestions, you know, help them work through things. And there was coaching in terms of executive coaching and other types of life coaching, but the, AD, the adult ADHD coaching strand started there. Now there are very reputable training centers and credentialing and working on ethics and things like that, things that are all part of, already part of psychology, but there's not that national licensing, um, which is a benefit to them because they were able to practice across state lines going back. So, but going back to, there's a lot of overlap in terms of what the outcomes are and the approaches. I, I think my coach friends and colleagues would agree with me if I say one of the benefits about um, being a psychologist, and I'll only speak to as a psychologist, with the coexisting depression, anxiety, substance use, relationship problems, I have backgrounds in those. So I, I won't say it's easy, but I would also say that if I'm having a session with somebody with ADHD and anxiety, I don't have to go, oh, today we're only going to focus on the anxiety because I really view them as overlapping and, you know, a, a, a feedback system on one another. You know, ADHD makes people prone for anxiety because a key feature of anxiety is uncertainty and ADHD is an uncertainty generator and anxiety can make avoidance and, you know, ADHD harder to cope with. So. Coaches, now there can be psychologists and psychiatrists and physicians who are also coaches. Sorry, you didn't know what you were getting into when you brought me on here. Um, it's they, fine, it's they, fine. They, they can also be coaches as well and maybe draw on their expertise. Um, but many people, you don't have to be a coach. Uh, you don't have to have a background in psychology or psychiatry or things like that to go in. So sometimes, and there are also other training facilities or ways to be a coach that may not be as for lack of a better phrase, regulated or reputable. And to call someone, a, to call oneself a coach, anybody could call themselves a coach. I mean, some of that is like sports teams. There's no probably, I don't think of credential, uh, credentialing yeah. to be, and I mean this in the true sense of the word, a football coach, because <laughs> I play soccer a lot. So that's <laughs> right. Football. Okay. Yeah. So, um, but um, so, and there is maybe a wide range of quality. Now there is the ADHD coach organization that is a very reputable organization um, that you know, has a find a coach feature. So all this going back to what you're gonna get out of it, it's a non-medical treatment that can help either on its own for somebody not taking medications, double down on the behavioral um, coping strategies, changes, patterns, developing habits, you know, um, increasing good habits, decreasing the unhelpful habits. It may take longer without medications. Um, so I think both professions have the same targets. There may be a broader net that we can cast in psychology with that training. Now, probably the, the bigger problem with psychologists is there's going to be fewer with a special expertise in adult ADHD. So it's easier to find a cognitive behavioral therapist than one with especially in ADHD. Now, there are many wonderful guidelines, the European consensus guidelines. Susan Young has been very involved in the UK in multiple guidelines, including for women, incarcerated individuals. Um, the US through APSAR, the American Professional Society of ADHD and Related Disorders is working on the, the first official US guidelines for assessment and treatment. And I'm involved in a work group called the Diagnosis and Treatment of Adult ADHD Data, where we're going to take the guidelines and come up with clinical toolkits designed for different professions. So I'll be uh, working with psychologists, there'll be psychiatric nurses, neurologists, different specialties, psychiatry, um, turning the guidelines into, all right, what does this mean for clinicians? So all that going back to, um, in terms of psychology, hopefully we'll have more guidelines they're going to be disappointing for everybody because it's not going to be a menu. Okay, now all I need to do is follow these steps and people will get better. It's going to be more broad-based, just like other guidelines are. 
So mm -hmm. there'll be more guidance for psychologists who are interested in this and hopefully get follow-up training. Um, you know, ADHD coaching, that it, it's all about adult ADHD, but it's probably more appropriate for coaches to refer out if there's coexisting mood, anxiety, relationship problems, um, things that they are not central. They're part of, you know, anybody working with adult ADHD is going to see these other things, um, but they may not be central for the training. Or like I said, there might be a psychologist or a psychiatrist who's also a coach where it is within yeah. the purview, but generally. So it's in the same ballpark that the, yeah. the fighting line gets really fuzzy. And in terms of, you know, individual professionalism of knowing when you're uh, crossing the line or, you know, should refer out. And I've referred to people, you know, people to coaches, one in the early days before the pandemic and the SIPAC credential where cross state virtual care what, uh, restrictions and licensed within the state were loosened to provide access. Um, I was always jealous of them to say, you know, they could from the get go, um, and even across international lines, which I cannot do, right. Right. but that's because it's not yet a credential profession. So right. you know, getting something in the same ballpark, some people like the flexibility afforded with coaching, like texting and various means of access, or they say, I don't need the full CBT protocol. And there was at least one paper focusing on, <laughs> yeah, one of the criticisms I guess from, and it's done kiddingly, but you know, also it's a, a content point of, and Dr. Beck said this later in his life, like CBT starts with sort of a, a negative flavor, distorted thoughts, maladaptive beliefs, even though it came from yeah. early my, uh, the protocol for depression, where yeah. negative thinking, the cognitive triad, negative use of self, uh, world and future were part, yeah. part of it. And that just persisted a bit. Now, I think right these days, it's probably an unfair over categorization. But, you know, like I said, there was one review where in terms of people going through coaching and whatnot, they found it to be more positive and strength based, even though I think there's a movement for that CBT. So I hope that yeah. listeners some guidance in terms of, you know, it depends what you want, what's accessible. Um, and yeah. what you can afford to, or what um, any healthcare coverage might mm. cover. I'm just thinking about what you said about you coming into this field in sort of 1999, going into 2000s, understanding of adult ADHD, because we know also the childhood ADHD, that's something that's been sort of well documented over the last you know number of years and things. And then it felt like people felt like adults or young people getting up to the age of 18, the ADHD would just go away right. without, yeah. It's actually in um, the original DSM, when it was um, entered as hyperkinetic reaction of childhood, it was in the 22-word right. description that generally remits by late adolescence. Um, yeah. So you didn't have to worry about it with adults. So what is it that you've noticed over the years, understanding of um, adult ADHD and some of the misconceptions, if you think back to that time and now, what's shifted over the like 30 years now? I guess so, something like that. Uh, uh, well, that, don't age you too much. I guess it'd be 25 this year. That's right, because we're going to be out. Uh, <laughs> yeah, our 25th yeah. anniversary would have been coming out. So by the time I left, we, we made it into our 25th year. But anyway, um, well, there was actually, you know, the um, DSM-2, Diagnostic and a Statistical Manual 2, came out in 1968, I believe. 67, 68, but if I had to bet, I'd say 68. I think that very same year, there was an outcome studied of hyperactive children in young adulthood who were describing persistent symptoms. So one or two studies came out. So at the same time, they're saying remits by childhood. But going back to 1999, so um, the publication of Driven to Distraction about 94, 95 was a watershed event because a lot of people reading it, you know, adults reading it and parents of children with ADHD reading it were saying, that sounds a lot like me or that sounds a lot like you. So one, I think being able to notice the, I'll say it two ways, the differences in the presentation of symptoms in adults, which is both developmental, we don't see at least the same, it's usually more that the hyperactive impulsive symptoms, they don't present the same in adulthood. I mean, they can to a degree, you know, these are bell shaped curves where some people still the bouncing foot, getting up, walking around, stuff like that. Um, but generally, 
the, the restlessness goes inward. It can be mental restlessness, maybe a little more bouncing foot, shifting in one's chair, tapping a pen, things that, you know, other people do when they're impatient too. Impulsivity, I think that's an underappreciated feature of ADHD, and especially in adults, because this is where the impulsive speech, saying the wrong thing at the wrong time to the wrong person in the wrong way, um, is impulsivity. Impulsivity is a core factor in procrastination. I know I'll be better off if I do this, but I feel like doing this now. I'll do this for a little bit, then I'll come back. That's impulsive. Impulsive spending. Impulse, yeah, and this is something that's burgeoned since 99. Um, technology use, impulsivity there. Um, so the appreciation that you may not see ADHD as easily and inattention itself can be invisible. Oh, look at him. He's studying so hard. His, he hasn't lifted his head up from the book, but he could be daydreaming or she could be daydreaming. And even among children, the... The going wisdom has been the women are overrepresented in the inattentive presentation, and that's why so many girls are missed. Now, I would agree with that to a degree, but when looking at girls, including teen young women, we're actually seeing more of the, emo the – and emotions are not listed anywhere in the diagnostic criteria, so that's an important difference that's still not categorized, but the emotional dysregulation – and that the impulsivity and restlessness may show up more in the social relationships than necessarily in the classroom, where the, the boy who's looking out the window, getting up, tapping their neighbor is more seen. And girls could be talking out of turn, other things, and there can be restlessness in the classroom, but generally isn't breaking as many rules or the more severe rules get that get teachers called in and maybe... One of the lines is, for young boys, their ADHD shows up in the classroom. For girls, it shows up on the playground. Now, that's – any any quote is going to be insufficient. So that understanding – so even in children, you know, some of how we see ADHD um, is harder. But then moving into adulthoods, into adulthood, women often get the diagnosis later because some of the difficulties are more often attributed to depression or anxiety that might come up for which you and I, that's like the common cold in behavioral health care. Yeah. Depression, anxiety, pretty much everybody can provide competent treatment for that. Now people might have their specialties where they go, I don't see that as much, but you're going to get pretty good exposure to it. Um, so, you know, what's that line? If all you have a, is a hammer, you start seeing an awful lot of nails. Yeah. Um, and so, Understandably, and these are, you know, I want to be respectful of the clinicians. They're going with what they, they're seeing, and it's not wrong. It's just incomplete and trying to be helpful. And most of them have not gotten exposed to ADHD in their graduate or other professional trainings. So knowing what to look for in adulthood. So you're right. In terms of what we see, the, the A and the H, and I'll pull in the I, seem like they're not there as much or even the impulsivity could be oh you just need better self-control or things like that it's like a very isolated poor habit this is where one of the important sea change that happened and i think it was also ongoing at 1999 but the self-regulation model of adhd you know that the single list of 18 symptoms in the dsm and the the icd they're not wrong but they're just incomplete. Yeah. And so the executive functioning or the self-regulation model, how efficiently do you do what you set out to do? Organizing behavior across time, um, pacing out your work, being able to get back to it. Nobody is perfect. And as I remind everybody, in case any listeners, it's not clear, we all have executive functions, these self-regulation, these suite of self-regulatory behaviors, things that we do to ourselves to manage ourselves. So if anybody woke up with an alarm today, that's self-regulation. If you had an alert for this podcast, that's self-regulation. You're, you're setting up the environment to guide you in the direction you want to go. Um, if you sign up for a personal trainer to make sure you get to the gym, that's self-regulation. If you go, I won't go unless I have this. So everybody has um, executive functions in these self-regulation capacities. So that's another thing. It's that myth like, well, don't we all have ADHD? 
Well, mm. when we're looking at the diagnostic criteria and everybody forgets this, that, and this is true of anything, depression, anxiety, anything, um, these symptoms, having symptoms is not enough. I've seen pe people with symptoms and they came in because, yeah, my friends, my spouse say I look really ADHD and they do, but they don't have any problems. You know, yeah. they're, they're the parent in the relationship who's scheduling and keeping the pediatrician appointments and they, in their job, they don't miss a deadline. So they're energetic, they're quick thinking, they're fast talking, um, but they can switch. They can do what needs to be done. Good, good self-control. So, you know, somebody, somebody with um, insomnia, their executive functioning will go down. Somebody in the midst of a major depressive episode, their executive functioning will go down. Somebody um, catching at the flu or COVID, their executive functioning will go down. But generally, if they don't have ADHD, as these situations, for lack of a better phrase, remit, executive functioning should go back up to a relatively stable baseline. Um, the thing with ADHD is it's a developmental syndrome of impaired self-regulation. It's not all or nothing. It's very context sensitive. How can they have ADHD? They can play video games all day long or a book they like or the, the biography of their favorite athlete, they can read cover to cover, but the two page thing they have to read for school and just answer five questions, it takes them three hours to get through. And the same you know, things for adults. Um, it's highly context sensitive, so people may not see it. Oh, well, if you can do it there, you must be able to do it everywhere else. Well, that's not necessarily the case, but that's how it can get viewed as a character flaw or whatnot, you just need to try harder. So this executive functioning, self-regulatory understanding, I think helps both with the diagnosis. Yes, you're gonna look for, at the, the list of 18 symptoms, but we're also looking at how are you at managing and tracking time, getting things done by uh, deadline, uh, breaking them down. How are you at organization of your thoughts in terms of writing, in terms of speech, um, managing stuff, being able to find what you need, not that everybody's apartment or living situation is going to be pristine, but generally everybody's going to have the slip ups now and again, but for individuals with ADHD, it's much more, much more consistent and regular um, with more negative effects and more severe negative effects over time that in extreme cases can lead to job loss, relationship loss, yeah. poor health that we're finding. So, um, in terms of some of the things over time, I think uh, the understanding of how symptoms change developmentally, and that also ties in with the context in terms of adults, there's before age 12, you know, the teachers at school, homework is very minimal. I'm not saying school is easy for everybody, but it's more, at least in the U.S., the middle school and high school where there's increased societal expectations for self-regulation. You keeping track of your homework, not relying on your parents or the professor in college, and also other people's reliance on you working in a team as an employer, uh, uh, a project group at school, a team for a sport, uh, a job or whatever, where now there's public, there's always public facing aspects of ADHD that can also um, affect mindset and emotions, but there's also the, the interdependence that goes with ADHD, working with a co-parent. Oh, and by the way, now you might be parenting children, tending to a pet, tending to plants, things that require organizing behavior across time. So I think that view of ADHD that I think is the going wisdom right now and it's evidence supported. And I mentioned the early days, Russ Barkley, Tom Brown, I'm blanking on her name, I'll think of it later, but um, yeah. you know, other neuros, neuropsychologists, the executive functions weren't anything new, but understanding their connection with ADHD is in terms of a developmental syndrome. I think yeah. that's probably one of the biggest um, changes and the increase yeah. during the pandemic, the increased attention to mental health and many more people. Um, now granted, it's a double-edged sword on yeah. social media. It has been a great marketing strategy, but there's a lot of the majority, at least in one review, the majority of it is non-credible information. So people might be right for the wrong reasons, uh, but many people are going to be wrong for the right reasons um, for what it's worth. Yeah, there's a lot of things that you mentioned that I wanted to, to bring up as well. You mentioned about the diagnostic criteria and the symptoms and the 18 questions. From a clinical point of view, obviously, we are 
um, that, that's the guidelines that we follow. And in some cases, not everyone's going to fit into that box. You know, I've seen that where we have to get, you know, get the you know the clients or patients to fill out these questionnaires. Sometimes they might not even score. They might not score that special score. Do we then penalise them and say, you don't have ADD or you don't warrant a further assessment based on that, given that the criteria isn't, as you say, it's, it's incomplete. It's not really going into detail in terms of all the other aspects of ADC that we know. Uh, and also you mentioned about how you know ADC has evolved over the years. And I'm just thinking about technology as well and social media and how that's played a part in what we are seeing and how these symptoms have evolved. Now we are in a society where everything's so fast paced and you've got all this pressure from, you know, you've got the internet now, you've got... When you came into this field, we didn't have all of this back then, or it was still kind of in, in, in its infancy. How has that, well, i just given you two examples there. How has the technology and, you know, use of social media impacted um, ADHD, particularly for adults, over the years, if you compare to before? Right. Yeah, talking about before, it reminds me of a line by a comedian. He said, yeah, when I was in school, all I had was the, uh, a pencil and a guy next to me. And if, if he would have <laughs> applied himself more, I could have been somebody. <laughs> um, you know, with the technology question, it's an important one, and it's an empirical question. So some of this, you know, I, I've done some reading on it um, about the effects of technology on the brain. Um, it's still empirical about how persistent it is. Is it actually, and I, it, it would be a reasonable hypothesis, and it'd probably be one I'd lay some money on, um, but that it creates some changes. Now, part of, from a societal standpoint, you know, are we creating ADHD with any new technology, even going back to the printing press and television, every step, if you will, forward has been met with, oh, books are going to rot people's brain because oral history and learning it verbally and memorizing things. And I think there was a strategy, I think it was among the Greeks of being able to put things in the hills where they would use the environment as reminders for what they wanted to say or stories. I think I have that right. Anyway, a lot of people, and they might say, oh, I'm so ADHD, I'm on my phone. But you know, in some ways, it's now people are aware of ADHD, including um, primary care physicians, teachers, educators. So it's out there. So I think people are looking for it. Whereas before it was like, you know, people will say, and you might see this too, people say, yeah, they didn't have ADHD when I was in school. But it's an empirical question because many people, even if they say I'm on my phone so much or whatever, at least anecdotally, when you look at it, they're able, they might stay on too long, but they set it down and they're able then to pivot. And the other thing is with technology, we're also able to get more done work, more work done, sorry, quicker. And there is from research on how society itself is trending towards the positive. There's still a lot of problems. It's not problem free, but you know, comparisons with a hundred years ago, what percentage of our income do we need to buy, say, a refrigerator? Where that was a very luxury item in the early 20th century. And nowadays, yeah, that's still a big purchase, but uh, you know, most people are fortunate enough they go, okay, it's a smaller percentage of our salary where it's not like okay, we're not going to, here's all the things we won't be able to do. And even with technology, it's allowed us to get more done more efficiently and have reminders and these um, externalized coping methods for ADHD and everybody, everybody's executive functionings. Um, so that going back to, it's an empirical question about the direct effects on the brain. Now that we have generations growing up with tablets and on their phones, I'm a Gen Xer. So I remember vinyl albums and cassettes and yep. all, all those things. Mm -hmm. um, so, and in terms of creating ADHD, I think it's probably more of a reveal where somebody who's holding it together, but now is on the, now has the phone and social media. It's not just the phone. It's the, you know, <laughs> The phone is probably the feature we use the least because I heard somebody say, yeah, calling a smartphone a phone is like calling a BMW a cup holder. Um, <laughs> it's not what we're using it for, but um, you know, people will be on their phone more, but how it's I'll, – I'll resist the urge to use uh, air quotes, but – and I don't want to add another diagnostic category, but where it is like at the, you know, a, an addiction – 
or at least somebody knows it's a weak point, sort of like if somebody has a weak point for smoking cigarettes, eating chocolate, where they go, I just can't have it around, where there's some need for concentrated control and pacing of the use of the phone, uh, which itself is a hard topic. But I think most people, if you will, neurotypicals or um, whatever we want to call the average range, and I'm just using like the bell-shaped curve, and there, there'll be people who are highly organized who said, I used the phone for what I need it, now I'm going to set aside and go do that. There's people at the other end of the curve. Um, but there might have been more people in the mild sub-threshold range that are getting bumped up a little more or has become more of a problem. People who are already diagnosed with ADHD or, you know, at least if they were undiagnosed, struggling with it, it might have been another log on the fire. But I think it's more of a reveal. And even going back to uh, what you mentioned about this, the diagnostic criteria, yes, it's part of a, a competent evaluation for ADHD. Even though they're flawed, DSM criteria, you know, part of every evaluation. And there are different ways to get it. The self-report measures are helpful and they give us norms. Um, it's also helpful asking by interview, even if it's the same items, because that way you can ask follow-up questions, give examples, because sometimes people go, oh, that's what that means. Um, the other thing is where the problem comes in, or one problem, I should say, people using the strict guidelines oh, you were 13, not 12 when you started having problems with this. So I'm not going to count that. Or um, now the criteria for adults with ADHD in the DSM is five out of nine symptoms of either presentation. Yeah. And it's the reproductive. Oh, yeah. you only have four. So you don't have ADHD. So it's almost like, oh, it came back. You're negative for COVID. So you don't have COVID. It's a dimensional. We all have the executive function. So we all fall on the curve somewhere. There are people at the the high, strong executive function that you want to be your administrative assistant, your travel agent, um, you know, you know those things that they're. It is a superpower at that end of the, the that that end. Most of us in the middle, where it ebbs and flows, but we have a pretty consistent baseline. And there can be people on the end of ADHD, and they might be, let's just say, one standard deviation down, where we go, yeah, that's not the diagnosis. You have many symptoms now. All that being said, and let's just say there's no comorbidities or other special issues. I don't think anybody's going to care if I say, I can't give you the diagnosis of ADHD, but you know, my approach that I use with adults with ADHD could be helpful. So nobody's going, oh, people are going therapy and people, you know, people are diverting and misusing therapy. No, it's the medications that usually is the question about. And it is a, a, a viable question. At what point do you med uh, medicate? But there can also be these sub threshold where you go, you don't have the, you don't meet the full criteria or for some people and maybe seniors where you go, we can't, you know, you don't remember and there's nobody that you can ask about yourself in childhood, even though everything you're describing and it's not better, you're, you're 75 and it's not better described by anything else. So we'll call this sub threshold or not otherwise or um, other specified in a new nomenclature, relatively new a decade now. Um, and we'll treat it as such, and we'll consider other, and after ruling out other options, cognitive decline, uh, maybe early dementia or something like that. Um, but there, there's a little more flexibility in there, even because, but I've heard, or accounts of somebody saying, yeah, they said I didn't have ADHD because I only endorse four out of nine symptoms currently, that it's this all or nothing as opposed to being dimensional of, and I'm yeah. all for accurate you know, reporting, like I'll say, I'm, I'll put this down as other specified for these reasons, but here's, it, it's not going to change the treatment plan. Do you think it's helpful then having this criteria that specifies the amount of um, symptoms, if you like, that needs to be added up to say five out of nine under the inattention domain and, you know, five out of nine, five productivity and positivity, because as you say, some people are very rigid with that. And particularly when we look at ADHD, we want to look at impairment in functioning as well, as much as they can have the symptoms. But if they are coping and generally doing well to some extent, although it might come at a price where they might be hyper-focusing on certain things and stuff. Um, yeah, I, I suppose, how, how do we, is it worth obviously for us clinicians to incorporate some measures that in uh, assess functioning rather than just looking at the ASRS or the CARS as a rating scale on its own? I, I think it's helpful. You know what? 
I, off the top of my head, you know, the World Health Organization you mentioned the ASRS and, you know, using the PHQ-9, a nine item for depression, the GAD-7, generalized anxiety disorder, seven scale, really quick, easy to use and in the public domain. And me, you know, the reason I left Penn July 1st was to start my solo virtual practice. I, I, I left on good terms with Penn. I wasn't ushered out the door by security or anything like that. Good terms. Very thankful the time there, but um, wanted to be, and not that I couldn't do things like this, but there's, you know, other projects and things at this point in my career I wanted to be able to do, including um, working from home, not having to commute into Penn on the train, and my colleague, Dr. Katz, my lumbar support animal, is sleeping behind me right now. So it works on a bunch of different levels, but also I appreciate now things I, we might have been able to get from our fund at Penn or you know, the Center for Cognitive Therapy, Dr. Beck Center. We got to use the Beck Depression Inventory for, for free there, um, but not anymore for me, at least. Um, I, I'm sure uh, Judy Beck would allow me to do it if she ever hears this podcast. She's, they're wonderful and very generous with the science. And they give it away, um, but I like doing things clean. So I know the World, World Health Organization scales, and I think there are a couple, and I'll, I'll say them by name, uh, just because they're both out there. And um, Margaret Weiss, who I mentioned before, has the Weiss Functional Impairment Rating Scale. I'm not sure if it's commercially available, um, but you might be able to track it down yeah. out there. There yeah. is the, and I think it is in the public domain, it's it's not exactly an impairment scale, but it is the, I'm blanking, the AAQ, the Adult ADHD Quality of Life Scale. Yeah. Um, so I think that's in the public domain. Another commercially available one, I know it's commercially available, and um, the the Barkley Functional Impairment Scale, and at least the last time I heard him speak on it, he said it's the only scale normed on a U.S. Uh, impairment scale normed on a U.S. population. But you know what? I, I would say if you need some sort of quantification, you could always come up with a 0 to 10 rating scale like we would with pain. How would you rate your pain right now? And how would you rate, and you could come up, which is what the Barclay scale is. It has norms. Um, it's different, like 15 domains of life. Some of them might not apply, like child rearing or whatever, and there's per percentiles. But if you need to give a, a score that you say, okay, anything eight or above is severe or above six or seven is moderate, something like that, that if anybody's going to look at the report or you need documentation for whatever reason, you could say, I did this assessment. Their self-rating, it seems consistent with their report. So this is the justif this is the justification for medical necessary services. And this is not trying to be sneaky. I'm, you know, I would never falsify things or whatever. But one of the things that was pointed out to me, and I didn't realize this before, within the DSM, distress, you know, even if somebody doesn't meet criteria. Now we're not talking about somebody coming in saying, and I've seen this for um you know, maybe everybody's relatives have ADHD and they come in and they don't have ADHD. They don't have anything. Um, and most people are okay with that. Um, but um, so I've seen people coming in where there's no impairment. Like I said, they looked ADHD. Um, but with distress, you know, people might come and it might be subthreshold. And but it's usually you, usually people aren't coming in. Usually people wait too long before they come in and the problems are bigger. But sometimes somebody will come in and they say, you know, you're okay in your relationship. You get along with your family. You're not in danger of losing your job. But they say, but I'm distressed. It's stressing me out because I'm staying up late. Yes, they're getting everything done, working hard. And people could say, well, isn't that just hard work? But if it is getting in the way of, you know, I wake up too late to take my child to school. Now, we could quibble about the definitions of impairment, but the distress, if it's problematic for the person. But distress is not included with ADHD probably because there's no emotional symptoms listed in the official. So distress is emotional. So it's, um, again, I didn't realize that until it was pointed out. So that's, yeah, we could mm. say distress can be, and, and it could be, you know, somebody's partner is distressed too. Yeah. As, as one of my clients says, I have ADHD, but my wife suffers from it. Mm. Um, and it's, yeah ripple effects on but that that would be family functioning impairment so i think yeah. there are different ways to get around it not slippery but being able to get the data in different ways that is affordable for practitioners who might be in a private practice and or if the other ones aren't as accessible ways to dutifully say had multiple ways but usually you're going to get the life stories 
of, you know what, I've left jobs several times, I've been asked to leave, and it, 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 when I'm describing this to professional audiences, talking about the assessment of ADHD, there's no one die in the wool, this is it, this is ADHD. There's many patches that you're seeing. Does this, do these patches form together in a quilt where we go, yeah, this covers the impairment, this covers the symptoms, this covers the executive functions, this covers the distress, this covers uh, functioning in these other domains. Um, does this cover, it's not better explained by something else uh, than yeah. that something else might, that the ADHD emerged before they grew depressed and depressed was from the job loss. And do we have this quilt? And it's also a useful way to say, now we got a couple things here and there, but it looks like this thing over here might be a better explanation, um, which some of my most rewarding evaluations have been, hey, it's not ADHD. It also gives you a way to explain, well, why did I score high on all the, the ADHD rating scales? They're having attention problems. That it can affirm that, but here's the source. It's sort of like a fever in general medical practice. The fever could be, the flu, it could be an infection, it could be malaria. We don't know the source of it yet. Um, so that's similar to like attention. Yeah. Um, all that glitters is not is not gold and all that is distracted is not ADHD. You, you touched on about earlier, we were discussing uh, when you first came into, um, into this field. And uh, if you compare it to general psychology, and I see a lot of psychologists out there that are not really like knowledgeable, familiar with ADHD, and they might be working with a client for many years, and the client is describing all these, some of these traits that we're describing because of their lack of understanding of ADHD. Some, I've come across some where they will have some idea of ADHD. They might get the client to fill out an ASRS questionnaire or something like that. Same applies to family GPs or doctors as well. My question is around, are we still underdiagnosing particular adults with ADHD? Is, is, is that still being underrecognized? It's getting better. Um, I think... Back in 2004, 2005, 2006, um, the lead researcher was Ronald Kessler at Harvard, and it was the National Comorbidity Study in the U.S. And they included like telephone surveys to try to get estimates of the prevalence of different diagnoses. Um, and that was the, that was the research that established, at least within the United States, in the early 2000s. 4.4% of adult Americans were estimated as having ADHD. Um, now, that was just based on this study. It doesn't mean everybody went through a full evaluation. What's always also interesting with, about that study as a side route um, before you know, getting back to the, the screening issue and over versus under, under diagnosing. And again, something just pointed out to me when somebody put it, oh, well, Dr. David Goodman, uh, a colleague and I consider a friend and um, ADHD expert. Um, showed that from that study, the most common psychiatric diagnosis was depression, about 6.6%, maybe a little higher. Adult ADHD was number two, and then anxiety, and then bipolar disorder, and then schizophrenia down, you know, number two. And so it's underrepresented in our training of health and mental health professionals. Um, so that's just another useful, you know, tidbit. So going back to the over, well, the, or how are we catching people? This is, you know, my interest in social psychology and general psychology. There, there are what, what are called heuristics, which, which go back to the work of Kahneman and Tversky about these quick ways we have make, of making sense of our world and our, the, in, the numbers be around us. And so it's, it, it's what happens if, sadly, if there's a commercial airline crash all of a sudden people say, oh, it feels more likely, or all of a sudden people are a little more concerned about getting on a flight. The numbers haven't changed. It's still a one in whatever, hundred, a million, or whatever it is. And that's just like commercial airline flights. I don't know if it's different for small planes and uh, my, <laughs> my expertise is limited. In it. But heuristics, this way we, it just feels, because you know, we're designed to you know, be akin, uh, akin to our local environment. So something that might be local, but these global, we're not good at these large numbers. So right now that availability heuristic, it feels like ADHD is all over the place because it's on TikTok and however many millions of hits, even though, like I said, there was a, a Canadian psychology journal has said maybe only 20%, I think it was just about TikTok. 
so I hope they don't sue me, but um, read that. Let's just say um, some social media, um, un unidentified social media outlet. I think they found that there was only about 20% credible information, either credible information or from some authority. Um, I have to go back and see, but I think the percentage was right. So there's a lot of information out there and a lot of people saying this is ADHD when it's not. Um, so it can feel like a lot. Now, going back to the Kessler study, around that time, it was estimated about only about 10% of adults in the US were actually diagnosed and, and getting specialized treatment for ADHD because there's that's a twofer. You can get diagnosed with it, but who's going to help you with it? Now, the numbers with more recent studies and just you know discussions with colleagues, you know, dis distribution of intelligence, everybody reading the studies, maybe we can say probably maybe about 25%, 20-25% of uh, adults with ADHD are diagnosed, but that's still a big number. Even if we bump that up to 30 or 40, that's still more than half probably are undiagnosed. Now, I don't know. Now, some people can be, sometimes the diagnosis can be, and, and this is necessary for research and it's good research, but I'll use the example from one study. And this is a couple years ago when, at least in the US, I think it was estimated like 20% of adolescent boys were diagnosed with ADHD. But the question was, has a healthcare provider ever said that your son or daughter has ADHD? Now that could be, it could be, I think you should get an evaluation. Um, yeah, I'm not familiar with ADHD. It sounds like it could be, it could be, oh yeah, they're just like my child, this is it. Or they seem ADHD. And, and I say that with all respect, and it's good research to have, and you operationally define, this is how we establish it. So the numbers are important. Um, so there, there, there can be, misdiagnosis but usually like i said people wait longer and i'll have pe people coming in for the evaluation and say frankly i hope i don't have it um so uh, you yeah, know anyway so yeah i'm giving you very academic um answers and uh no 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 it, it's and, fine very clear questions but no yeah. so i think i think 20-25 uh, percent are probably um identified there there's still a lot of people and whether it's access or affordability because the, there are many barriers to getting the accurate and and just lack of people with the the competence and some people i i have no business being your guest because when you think about my my job application on march 8th 1999 I had no experience. Hey, how would you like to do surgery? I've heard of surgery. Yeah, bring me on. Um, so, um, but you know, and some people, you know, and but some people can do the work and maybe get supervision or you know, um, Apsar, who I mentioned before, um, Cadra, the Canadian. Oh, you can in the UK. Yeah, you can. Yeah. Yes, yeah, there's many great um, UK um, services. I mentioned Susie Young. I want to call out Phil Asherson is a. An expert. There's a lot of really good people. Oh, and Jessica Bramham was a co um, uh, Susan Young's co-author. Yeah. Um, um, excellent, excellent, excellent work. And um, um, Jessica and Susan's book, um, I I thought was great. And I still yeah. think it's great. Um, <laughs> anyway, so all that to say, yeah. there's a lot of good resources out there, and people. Some people do the work, and and or they're the only game in town. And yeah, you know, one person comes to them for ADHD and they had success, and then all of a sudden you're the ADHD expert in the area. So some people yeah. can buy it honestly and do the work, and but there and um, there might be a lot of it missed or being you know, identified as something else. Yeah, and getting to that partially. You, you talked about self help, and I'm glad you mentioned that because obviously you've got your uh, the book you published, uh, Adult ADHD Toolkit, um, which has been you know translated into multiple languages. Um, and I'll the mention world. the forthcoming one, the Adult ADHD and Anxiety Workbook, is coming out May first. Oh wow! Okay, I'll definitely come back to that towards the end. Um, so, how important is self help resources in the management of ADHD? With given that you obviously you published a book, which is a right, self help right. guide. Yeah. Well, you know what? I, I said in the book, I said, I think this is the line. I said the notion of self-help with somebody with executive functioning problems. Now, it, this is for, you know, it, it's um, self-deprecating in a way, but also, you know, the notion of self-help for ADHD is oxymoronic. It's like jumbo shrimp or something like that. Uh, or I'd say, or maybe just moronic that if this was this easy and yeah, I think the line I use in the book, many people come to me and say, I know what I need to do. I just don't do it. You know, this is one of the lines in um, ADHD's uh, um, 
an implementation problem uh, for, or a performance problem, not a knowledge problem. So in the book, we could say, hey, use a planner. Um, people go, I tried, I know that, but I can't, it's the implementation. So one, I think it can be helpful, very helpful as a guide, because even though sometimes people say, yeah, I know about using a planner, but seeing it sketched out, here's what it does, here's the format. And not that anybody goes, oh, I've never seen a planner, but also like, here's what you put in and here's what you don't put in and leaving time to get from point A to point B. People know it, but sometimes hearing it or it's in the moment, you, you know it, but you don't do it. Like, you know, there's things you and I know, like, hey, you know what? Right after I'm done work for the day, get on the exercise bike and get the workout done right away. Because if you wait, you're going to get this. Not, I don't think I have ADHD. I'm not going to get ADHD distracted, but feeding the dogs, other, oh, maybe hanging out with my wife. Hopefully she still likes me and other things. And all of a sudden, oh, it's getting late. I'm tired. So there are things we know, but do we do it when we need to do it? So I think the self help materials, Ari Tuckman, Susie Young has a whole website on things for professionals and whatever. Um, I just saw her recently as a con at a conference for the first time in many years, so I was very happy to see her. Um, but many, Sharon Celine has some good books. I know I'm going to forget people, so forgive me for leaving you out. Um, Russ Barkley, Taking Charge of you know, ADHD, there's a whole host of really good ones. So they can be useful guides, um, but also they can also be useful in working with a coach, a psychologist, you know, somebody else, an educator for a student, um, you know, somebody else who you know, can help problem solve a little bit or what some people say, just knowing I'm going to go share this with somebody helps make it a little more salient because a little bit, okay, I got that meeting tomorrow. I want to show how I use my planner this week or, or something like that. So very long winded. I think they can be helpful for a lot of people. Just tossing them a self-help book won't be enough. It'd be like I said, tossing me the instruction manual for doing car repair. I'm not the handiest guy. So it'll be okay, I see all the parts in there, but I don't know, you know, without losing at least one appendage, I don't know how I'm going to be able to put this to good use. So that would be where Yeah. it can also be a springboard for, okay, I, I should reach out to somebody who can help me with this. And the therapeutic alliance is really important for ADHD. And this is one of the other things CBT in general has gotten short shrift for, but sitting across from somebody who gets it, who understands the frustrations, who's able to go, you know, people going, oh, we're still talking about my procrastination. This is the fourth session in a row. You must be so tired of me. It's like, no, procrastination is a big one. If it was this easy, you know, I'll tell people, if all I bring to the table, we're talking about procrastination is you need to start earlier. Sue me for malpractice, please. You know that. It's how do we figure out how you procrastinate and how you can find the the little change points in the procrastination cycle, the smaller changes, not, oh, I have to stop procrastinating today. All right, how do I make, how do I make a plan for one o'clock that is reasonable so I'm more likely to do it and remember to do it? You still might not do it, but now we have a more granular problem to solve rather than, nope, just try tomorrow, try again tomorrow and try not to procrastinate tomorrow. Yeah, it is a real struggle. Some people, as you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, so some people describe a pain like in terms of trying to get themselves organized or to concentrate like they can't do it right. and it's, it's trying to shift to change that mindset that because obviously the intention is there they, they know they have a job to do but as i said it's, it's a struggle uh, and, and then to someone turning around saying you know just keep trying harder you know tomorrow's the best day and um it feels quite dismissed isn't it so that's, or what, yeah. one line I heard from Russ Barkley or a second hand, yeah. somebody said, Russ Barkley said, it. he said, a child with ADHD has two good days in a row and it's held against them the rest of their life. You were able to do it last week. You did fine. You got your homework done. Why can't you do it today? Well, those are the outliers. Those are those things that that's the maddening thing, thing that people say. I know I can do it. And when I get down to it, I do a really good job. You know, so I got an A on that paper, but I don't have the confidence going into the next paper. Will I be able to? get it done, organize my thoughts, submit it on time. I know once I get it done, it's most likely, or even if I pull the all-nighter, I'll get a passing grade, but it could have been so much better. And then the instructor goes, oh, yeah, you had that great paper last time. I was just a little surprised. Or you know it so well in class if it's a discussion. But then when it came to, you know, keeping up with the homeworks or, miss, you know, 
not the quality of work, not submitting homework and then losing points, the performance costs of ADHD. I know I'm preaching to the choir right now. So yeah, and people describe one boredom as a very painful emotion, but also this is that emotional regulation piece. I know I can do it, but it's really hard to do because it takes me longer. It's more of a struggle. What one colleague described as working twice as hard for half as much. Um, there's, you know what? There, I don't think there's anything wrong with the easy way out or trying to get things done as quickly as possible. As long as you're not sacrificing quality or, you know, like I said, a surgeon going, ah, one stitch will be enough. And I, I'm going to save time and not, not wash my hands before I do surgery. No, still doing your due diligence, but no, I, I, I think quick solutions are great. Who wants to say, yeah, I really want to spend more time in school or, you know, um, whatever. Uh, I'll just take an extra semester. Now people might do that for a double major or something like that. But no, yeah, a yeah. lot of times it's like, and yeah, it's most people will describe, I just want some reasonable cause and effect. If I put in an hour, I want to roughly get, I know it might take me a little longer, but in the ballpark of an hour and that when I submit it, I know it'll at least pass. It's not like I want an A plus, I want to get a scholarship or whatever. I just want to get through to the next thing with, you know, and just, and also build up my sense of esteem and confidence and competence. Hmm. So you can yeah. Humble, humble desires. Well said. Uh, touching on your new book, um, before we touch on the new book, you've got Rethinking Adult ADHD book as well that came out. 2020. No, 2020, yeah. Uh, do you want to share the new uh, the new book and also kind of what perspectives uh, to expect in there? What what are you offering in, in in your new publication? Well, this one's you know what we always said our the toolkit was our client manual, uh, a client workbook to our you know CBT for adult ADC manual. Um, it's not a true workbook in terms of I, I mean there we gave which I like that we did we gave a numerated list of co different coping strategies to make it more. You know, it is sort of like a sequencing. Um, and actually, I've heard uh, since then some research on behavioral scripting, and that's how humans have learned things, like like sequence of steps. And even if a step is unnecessary, we learn it because it's more the whole thing until you know innovation. And this is some of the work of Joseph Henrik and you know things like that. Um, anyway, so I didn't do that intentionally at the time. It just seemed like it worked having a menu of things. <clears throat> so the... The adult ADHD and anxiety workbook is more of a proper workbook. Um, and, you know, there's a lot more exercises, um, you know, still suggestions and lists of things. Um, the review of, you know, the, the, the cognitive behavioral therapy approach um, and divided up, which I did in the rethinking book. Um, so it's got the coping skills for ADHD, but also putting them through like the, the CBT lens. All right. This makes sense how to do the planner, but what are what are the negative thoughts that might come to my mind based on my past history? Oh yeah, this will work for a little while, and and the emotions and the behaviors. Um, also looking at, and this was a surprise. Um, two full chapters, about a third of the content. Uh, well, actually, a third of the pages ended up being about uh, navigating the social world and relationships, dealing with reject rejection sensitivity, setting limits. What I describe as, and others have too, you know, sometimes due to the public facing aspects of ADHD, always running late, maybe getting these little, it might be good natured humor, or at least that's what the person thinks, but it's like, oh, you're on gen time because you always show up 10 minutes late, which, you know, if you take it as good humor, that's fine. But sometimes people go, oh, that, yeah, I am always late. And that's another reminder. And I try not to be. So that aspect, and, and I've, said elsewhere, even going back to the rethinking book, where I think self-advocacy and assertiveness are underutilized strategies, not assertiveness as aggressiveness, get in there and get what you want. But sometimes assertiveness is just restating facts as we see them. I think I order French fries with my sandwich, not potato chips, or somebody going, excuse me, supervisor, it'd be really helpful for me if I could have a check-in with you every Friday about uh, and update you on my project, because that really helps keep me on track. And it's not a, any major accommodation. It's, yeah, maybe a time accommodation or a time cost for your supervisor of 10 or 15 minutes. But it's, you know, at least having, feeling you have the social capital, I can at least ask for that. And you don't have to say the letters ADHD. It's just, hey, this just helps me stay on top of things because it's hard organizing these big projects. 
So yeah. that that's sort of it, and it covers procrastination and the planner as two of the main things for dealing with anxiety and also talking about the why does ADHD and anxiety overlap so much, and it, which I spoke to earlier. One of the more recent, 90, 1998 was like a seminal article on this, but the role of intolerance of uncertainty in anxiety. So it is still the perception of risk or danger. And that could be getting on an airplane if you're concerned about it crashing. It could be fear of dogs from a previous, a phobia or something like that. Um, but also it can be the uncertainty. You know what? I think everything's okay, or I think this plane will be okay, but there's that 1%. Or, oh, I think I was okay sending that document by email, but what if identity theft? I'm not 100% sure it's not. And how the that uncertainty, and my line on that is ADHD is an uncertainty generator. I know I can do it, but will I do it when I need to do it? Or, and also with the social side, um, did I say the wrong thing? What are they thinking about me? Um, and not that not knowing that you're running a couple miles inside emotionally churning on that with the, with the not knowing. And that can, you know, it's like gasoline on fire with ADHD. Yeah. In a way it's good because you've got the self-awareness though, isn't it? I know you're, you, you, you kind of checking in and questioning yourself too much, but. Well, and, that's... Also nor and also normalizing emotions. So let's understand yeah, why yeah. anxiety is there and does it fit with this situation? And that, yeah. that's also the, the emotional management piece is another, uh, thing I'm pretty proud of. Um, yeah, I'm sure other people, as hopefully happens in our work, you know, people take your work and find ways to do it better and things like that. And um, But just understand, you know, sometimes just emotional labeling has been found in other research to be helpful, but also knowing, identifying our feelings. And a lot of things you'll hear from uh, folks with ADHD, you'll hear guilt and shame a lot. And breaking down into, well, Guilt is associated with the theme of, or um, it's a, an emotion associated with perception that we've done something wrong. And that can be accurate. I said the wrong thing. I, I <laughs> going back to the football, I insulted your football club. Um, so uh, I apologize for that. I, I didn't know you were a fan. Yeah, we can make amends. And that's what guilt does that much if it's dose dependent. But what happens, many people with ADHD often due to ADHD and the mistakes and snafus that can come up in social situations, it's out of proportion. It's uh, racked with guilt about other things. You know, Diane Beaton, I forget what UK, B-E-A-T-O-N, I forget the institution she's with. I don't think it's, I, I don't think it's Cambridge or Oxford, and I'm sure those institutions don't uh, mind that I mix them up sometimes. Um, no, but she's done some work, some qualitative interview work on the criticisms, the experience of criticisms um, by adults with ADHD that I thought was very helpful. And generally, the inattentive domain is the largest source of criticism. But you know, what, we probably want to bundle into that, like time management, procrastination, forgetting the follow through, showing up late, because that's sort of pushed into the, pur the purview of inattention. Within the social domain, it's impulsivity saying the wrong thing, talking too much, uh, you know, um, doing the wrong thing, uh, you know, whatever the case may be, leaving too early, buying too much, impulsive spending, whatever, um, which I thought, and, and also that people describe what is helpful is when friends, even if they don't totally understand ADHD, they get it and they're supportive or they try to understand or they listen as opposed to the criticism or thinking it's a joke and things like that. No, surprise, surprise. If we feel accepted and a sense of belonging, we feel better. But it's as we're talking about neurodiversity in the workplace and thing, and discussions like that, which I think we're moving ahead in positive ways. Um, you know, I, I think there are some you know, things that just like, hey, can I have a 10 minute meeting with you on Friday about the update? There's some relatively minor things that we can do. It's not like, oh, it's like going to learn a new language. No, it's some yeah. good, good per person straights directed, um, you know, directed where they need to go. What's your thoughts about rejection, sensitivity, dysphoria? Um, William Dodson, Bill Dodson, a psychiatrist in Colorado in the U.S., has really been at the forefront of that. Um, and a lot of it has come from at least I can't find any chapters or peer reviewed articles. There are, there's online content that you can find. 
um, some of it through Attitude, A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E magazine. I get no money from them, but I always feel I have to do the disclosure. I am on the scientific advisory board of it, but, um, and, you know, rejection sensitive dysphoria, I liken it to um, imposter syndrome. It's not an official thing, but I think I think we can all agree it captures an experience that's not unfamiliar, or at least that we can go, oh yeah, I could see how that could be a thing. Now it has come up in terms of people with um, maybe atypical depression who also have that borderline personality. I'm sure there's some other diagnostic categories where it would come up with, and he has seen it in ADHD. My take on it, and this is respectful, this would be academic, and I think I referred to Dr. Dodson, I finally got to meet him once for like 15 seconds in an elevator at a reason. And it's like, oh, we finally get the meet. And then that was it. Um, no, but I'm, I appreciate the work he does. So here's how I put it together. Now this goes to the emotional regulation piece of ADHD. That's not in the official diagnostic criteria. So we have that maybe proneness to more emotional sensitivity. And this can also be down regulation of emotions when we're upset or up regulation of emotions when we need to gear up to do something, which is part of um, not procrastinating. You know, the ability to generate an emotion about a task in the absence of an immediate consequence, to feel like studying three days before the exam when nobody in their right mind is ever going to feel like studying. Um, so we have that. We have a cohort of individuals, individuals with ADHD, diagnosed with ADHD in childhood, throughout school, and into adulthood, or identified in adulthood, who have faced these public-facing mistakes like one of my clients said, yeah, whenever I was called in in class, my first, name, my, my first response was, huh, what? Uh, or they walk into a work meeting, okay, we're ready for your presentation. I forgot. Well, whatever the case may be. Other, other things, human snafus, but being more sensitive, these things build up more, having a hard harder time regulating the feelings and also having a hard time changing the behaviors because – you know, many of us will have like one of those big, oops, I forgot the date of the birthday party or I got something wrong. And usually we say, okay, that's going to be it. I'm I've taken corrective action. And then maybe the next one is like three years later that they're few and far between, but they happen, but they're more common and somebody making the same mistake. I'll share this one. Somebody had to take a high stakes exam. I'll, I'll just cover it up. Let's just say it was the admissions exam to get into um, business school. So it's like a standardized exam that you need the U.S. to get into business school. The first time they took the test, they thought they were done. And then as they're handing in their exam, it's a little old school. They saw there are three pages of test I overlooked and I didn't answer. So they got an okay, but low score. Took the test again. Okay, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. They did the same thing again. So it missed several pages. It affected their score. Third time. I'm ready, I'm getting there early, whatever, I'm ready to go in, I'm gonna go through all the pages. They locked their entrance ticket in their car and they had to run back and break the window of the car to get the ticket to be able to take the, the exam. So these recurring things, not exactly public, but these sorts of, these things happen and I have a hard time making them not happen again. And for me, that's like um, putting it together in this stew of all right, it makes sense then that as people would be more prone of anticipating this generally doesn't go well or people are going to think badly or I'm going to mess up somehow, being more likely to interpret something as a bigger mistake than it is or also rely on mind reading. No, they said it was okay, but I know they're just being nice. Somehow of it turning into this internal grinding, I'm no good, maybe avoidance. One person I, I work with would describe his rejection sensitivity as when I'm meeting somebody new, including a new coworker or somebody who's not in his inner circle, he says, I find myself bracing. I'm waiting for what's going to happen. How am I going to mess this up? Which is putting words on a visceral, defensive, anxious feeling. So that's my take on rejection sensitivity, at least specific to ADHD and how it might be um, yeah. not unique there, but well, I, I guess it would be unique to the, the assortment of experiences and symptoms and presentations that it goes through. That's the, I find that's tricky because obviously some of what you just described could be put down to anxiety. And how would you then separate and differentiate between anxiety and RSD in this case? Well, you know what? In this case, I, um, 
I think that's why it's in the book on anxiety, because I think it is anxiety and it can be anticipatory anxiety, which is self-protective, which is important to understand. And it can also be sometimes, you know, how do we reframe and understand the positives of our emotion? Okay, this is here to protect me. And it would be like somebody getting up to do a, a lecture in front of people who maybe their anxiety, it can also be reframed as, well, this is the energy you need, because you know how this is. This takes some energy to do and talk this long. Um, this is my aerobic workout for today. Um, but so it's also, yeah, because those sensations, all the same things, pulse rate going up, feeling a little jittery, you know, the adrenaline going, well, that's also what we use to gear up to do something. And as you get to your second slide, you know it will burn off. So it is also contextualizing and the positives of these things. So that anticipatory anxiety. So I don't think we really have to tease it apart that much. But yeah, asking about when somebody, what's it like being in your skin? How would you describe your feelings? If the anxiety is there, okay, you're seeing this as a threat. Now let's use our cognitive skills to see, you know, is there another way to look at it? What is the threat here? Are there things you can do? And also, are there some things you can do to soothe your anxiety and turn the dial down? Even if maybe there's a percentage of it, a low percentage of it, they go, I don't want to totally eliminate this because this will keep me on guard and make sure I remember to ask them about them before I start talking about me, like a coping plan. So even in mild forms, and it's changing. I like, I've used, and I don't think it's anything original, but I say, we just want to change the relationship with your emotions. This isn't blunting them and not experiencing anxiety because we wouldn't want that because there are times that you go, yeah, I'm not sure if I could, sh I should sign up for this added responsibility at work because I'm busy enough already. You know, we want to use the signal, but also see when it's getting in the way of things. So it's being able to label, see the positives and including with anxiety, sometimes the positive feelings can feel like, you know, we use, even use the word, I'm anxious for my vacation. That's because the feelings of the positive gearing up. Now we also want to be careful there that we don't become impulsive and overdo it on on that front but it's you know finding you know changing the relationship with your emotions you know seeing what signals are giving you being able to decipher them and uh work with them and persist with them as a way to you know further for lack of a better phrase retrain them yeah yeah well said um just a few more questions before we finish i'm just going to the time um just looking forward to the future um what advance uh, advancements do you hope to see in the treatment of uh, ADHD and also the understanding of adult ADHD particularly? You know what? I know they said, and, and th this is a little different answer, but it's related. Um, even within medications for ADHD, I've heard some psychiatrists comment, yeah, we're getting more brands, but they're all with the same molecules. So maybe if there's some novel agents there, I think within the psychosocial treatments and, you know, particularly uh, CBT, I mean, there's going to be ongoing work about how do we, what are the, what are the nuances when you're working with somebody with anxiety or depression or substance use, you know, some of the, the common comorbidities. I think something that might be very helpful is looking at ADHD affected relationships and marital or marital or couples therapy, where at least one partner has ADHD. And maybe that's a little different than when both heart partners have ADHD. And as an extension of that would be family therapy. You know, and what happens when one parent, I guess we could do multi-generational where there's multiple generations. No, but but the different ripple effects of ADHD, and not that every couple's problem is their direct result of ADHD or family problem is necessarily the result of ADHD, but it might be a factor in, you know, household chores, you know, just different dynamics there. But that would be part of, you know, some progress. Um Tatja Hervakoski in Sweden, I think, had done some work, early work on, uh, I think it was couples and maybe some family uh, group work. And I, I forgive me if I forget the, the name and the country, but I think I have the Sweden right. Um, also, access, um, remote ask, access, and whether, and I think there are probably some people working on this, ways to use... Um, I know this has been done on cognitive behavioral therapy for depression, you know, being able to have some online content where some of the basics you can view online and, and as in terms of self care and access these things as coping reminders at the point of performance and when you need them, not just, you know, Wednesday at 11 AM. Um, 
some work in the research, uh, some research on cognitive behavioral therapy, and I think especially with college students, they would intermingle individual sessions one week, group sessions the other week, and then between sessions, they would call them coaching calls, double checking on the homework tasks, the whole notion about, okay, it's a performance problem, not a knowledge problem. Somebody walks out of a session or logs off these days, uh, say, okay, that's what I'm going to do. But then an hour later, oh, I'm busy. I'm doing other things. And it's easy to forget. Um, so other ways to have reminders outside of our phones and other technology. Now, again, some of these might be time and labor intensive, and maybe there's some online versions of doing that, like even a, a pre-recorded, you know, check in with this every week as a reminder or something like that. Um, yeah, I think there's more credible online content. Um, you know, coaching, you know, it has some research behind it, including, I think it's been a while for a randomized controlled study, but um, the, the JST coaching approach went through it uh, several years ago. So there, there's some credible research behind it. Um, so that, that is ongoing because there's a little more flexibility there. In terms of some of the on other um, non-medical treatments, still curious to see neurofeedback training is one of those that's always sort of there in the middle. It, it's not enough yeah. that we can call it a, I don't know, credible or an evidence-based treatment for ADHD, but it seems like there might be something there. Not exactly sure what is it actually train changing um, networks in the brain. Is it some sort of behavioral reinforcing better attention that might, and there there have been things in the past. And also some of the games now you'll hear for kids with ADHD that um, are, oh, I forget the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration for technology. They, it's, it's not approved. There's a different um, phrase, accepted or something like that, that they use. Um, so these are all the, the use of technology. But you know what? When yeah. I expect behavior change, you know, sometimes what's the phrase? I don't think there's ever a free lunch with that stuff because even with like exercise and healthy eating and things like that, there's usually it's, you know, it's an endurance race. Coping is an endurance race. So it's, um, yeah, but I, th I still think even within the CBT coaching and other such models, there's, you know, the externalization of coping, you know, supports, including books and podcasts and things like that. So I yeah. think that's that's a nice thing where, and people using social media to connect with others. And that, I think that's another, you know, positive of you know, like online support groups and online information, like podcasts like this. So I think yeah. there's a lot more out there that can be helpful and credible for a lot more people and, and maybe even working those in the, into protocols. And, and certainly for us clinicians, uh, what, what advice would you give to us in terms of just, you know, from, from a treatment point of view or from an assessment diagnostic point of view, um, you know what? I think the uh, some sort of executive functioning scale, or and you know what? It's it's also remember, and this is also with the diagnostic criteria. You know, we we talk about some of the the scales that might be commercially available. Well, somebody could make a DSM scale. You know, hopefully you have the DSM, but um, or you know, come up with a list of symptoms or an impairment scale. You could come up with whatever, and maybe somebody working in it with a particular population. You know, could come up with an eating disorder impairment scale. I'm sure there is one, but something that's, you know, if they're working with, you know, parents or partners, come up with something there, just a, a zero to ten, um, and even, you know, do a reading on executive functions and, you know, like Russ Barkley's work. I think he outlined some a bit, um, and you could come up with okay, a, a zero to four, one to five scale, just to get an overview. And it's a different vista on ADHD. The, the 18 DSM symptoms and I guess ICD, they're not wrong. They're just incomplete. So um, there are things that you can do both to get familiar with these things. And tell you what, going back to the education and like I said, I was working with depression and anxiety and other categories before I walked into the room with uh, Tony Rostein that day. But after all these years, I found the executive functioning self-regulatory model has helped me with the clients I still see just with depression, just with anxiety, behavioral activation for depression, progressive exposure for anxiety. How do you get somebody to do something nobody's going to feel like doing? It's a helpful overall model in terms of framing and carrying out treatment. So it's not like, oh, I'm going to do all this for my three ADHD clients. No, it's going to help you with your other clients. So, And you know what? There is a series of books. Pardon me, I'm looking on my bookshelf of, 
um, the Smart But Scattered series. I get no money from them. Peg Dawson and Richard Guare. It's a nice compendium of executive functioning tools and monitoring scales and things like that. And it started off with children, young adolescents, adolescents, um, and, it's, and it's generic. It's not just ADHD, but it's just general executive functioning. Um, and now has books going into young adulthood, um, like failure to launch, um, and also for adults, uh, full-fledged adults. So that's another resource if you want to get in there. And they might actually have some tools that are relevant for clinical practice as well. And from a diagnostic point of view, in terms of like when we talked about some of the rating scales that are used for uh, screening and assessing, um, you're obviously familiar with the uh, DIVA, the Diagnostic Interview yeah, Sandra in Adults. Yeah, Sandra yeah, yeah. OIJ. And Susie Young probably has a lot of things on her website as well. But yeah, the DIVA. She does. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I'm, I, there's probably some others um, that I'm not thinking of that are in the public domain, but I think the DIVA is in the public domain. No, it's an excellent, it's an excellent scale. I always yeah, forget yeah. about that one. I'm sad because, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think the world of Sandra and her work. Of course, yeah. And you, and you mentioned um, Susan Young. She, she said she has one, which is for adults, and she's got one for children and young people as well, which is kind of similar to the diva, but um, more kind of in-depth and in, uh, detailed. So um, if people want to find out more about yourself, um, where can they reach you in terms of, like, your social media presence or website? Yeah. I mean, I'm a, I post things, but probably the easiest way to either find things like I'll, with your permission, I'll post this on my site and other podcasts and, you know, you know, books and you can, and some of the, um, the reputable, um, societies on, um, ADHD. And it's a way to get in touch with me. I'm pretty easy to find online. If you just Google me and just spell my last name correctly, R A. And this will also be important for the, um, the website, but no, the website is, I'm sorry, www cbt number four adhd.com sometimes people hear that as cbd and get really excited but it's not that what that's not that <laughs> website um, right. and my and my email is just ramsey r-a-m-s-a-y at cbt for adhd.com do you see clients from all across the world i can't do out of country that's one limitation now a colleague has said all right if you're given like 10 sessions a year to uh, somebody in, in London or Glasgow and I'm Scottish. So I have to throw in Scotland. To, um, um, <laughs> well, I, I didn't know are, that. Are, are they well, Ramsey is a Scottish name. Um, are yeah, they yeah. are Nairn? If anybody wants to look it up, I've never been there yet, but, um, but, um, Oh, um, you know, somebody raises a point. Yeah. If you, if you have 10 sessions a year with somebody in Glasgow or is somebody really going to sue you and yeah, whatever you, you make from that pay, 20 times that in international law fees to bring you up on charge probably not but i'm sort of a by the book guy so but um but no i'm happy to share resources with people from around or if i know referrals in the area i don't know necessarily know everybody everywhere uh, another you know for people looking for people a, another piece of advice i give look on the um board of directors or the professional advisory boards of some of the major um, ADHD societies, wherever the European group, you know, you can and others in the UK and APSARD and CHAD and ADA, ADDA, the Attention Deficit Disorder Association in the US, just to see any affiliations that might be near you or, you know, the six degrees of separation, just to see, you know, other people you can contact to say, hey, I see you're located here. Do you have any recommendations at your facility or nearby? And even if it's an adjacent country, sometimes you can hone in but the truth be told it's still a niche specialty where there might be some areas where at least you know somebody might be really good but you just won't hear about them or maybe they don't publish or you just don't know about them oh Ari Tuckman is somebody I want to mention too about good oh science. yeah Ari yeah That's yeah so yeah he did, he did um forward for my forthcoming book and I'll the only the only hesitation I had is somebody's going to read the forward and see how much of a better writer than I am he is. So, um, <laughs> right. no, I, I sent him a message afterward. It's just like, yeah, you know, you're such a good writer, Ari. You 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 embarrass me. So, and I think the world I think the world of Ari. He's a great guy, and just yeah, he was just inducted into the Chad Hall of Fame this past fall. 
and deservedly yeah. so and belatedly yeah. so. But yeah, anyway. Of course, absolutely. <laughs> uh, and yeah, yeah, I've, I've spoken to him a few times as well and we brought him on in this podcast, which is amazing. And yeah, met him at the recent International Conference on ADHD. Um, that, you know, I've seen you a few times, as I said. Um, you, you're, um, you said you've left um, working with the uh, the university. Yeah, Pens- I'm, no uh, longer, I'm no longer affiliated with the University of Pennsylvania. I'm retired, technically, okay. for the benefits. Um, right. I have to reach out to him. I, I was given misinformation. I, I didn't think because I, I, I'm not still helping him out with any projects, I couldn't use the emeritus. So I have to go back and check to see if it's okay because I just learned something else. But as of now, I just put retired behind my name. No, so I just have a solo virtual practice. So it's just me um, and just I, the word I use, I can just be more flexible at this point in my career, things I want to do. And I, again, Penn didn't limit me, um, but at least in terms of my financial productivity and keeping up with numbers, I, I'm a more flexible boss with myself than, and I always met my numbers at Penn, um, but you know, I just have even more flexibility here. And uh, any, any conferences uh, that you're giving talks to coming up? Coming or talks up? At- yeah. You know what? I actually, in the UK, it's um, bespoke, B-E-S-P-O-K-E, mental health. I'm doing, um, I'm doing a two-day webinar for them in July. Um, I'm doing, I mentioned the attitude. I'm doing a webinar for them in, it's their 500th webinar, and they asked me to do a session on procrastivity. I'm doing that for them in mid-April. April 18th. And if you log on, you can, uh, you sign up and you, you get it, you can attend for free. So it's like a one hour webinar. In terms of conferences, not yet, but I'll probably do an application for Chad. I mean, some of the ones that I attend, the application, uh, some of them I let go, like my APA and things like that, that just I don't think would work. But I'll probably do Chad next year, which I believe, I forget. Oh, it's in Anaheim, California. And yes, it I, is. Yeah, I, I usually do AppSart every year, and next year, next January, which is a great professional conference if anybody's interested in it, and really welcome. You know, it has a more of an international presence too. Like I said, Susie Young did a co- keynote there. That's where I saw her last. Right. Um, it's it's going to be in San Diego um, in January of next year, twenty twenty five. Right. And uh, yeah, two, I'm, I'll, I'll at least attend. I don't. I don't always speak at AppSart, but I usually go. Um, but I'll see what else. Sometimes I get asked to do something, but um, the bespoke um, is a two day that I'll be doing in July webinar. Excellent. Amazing. Um, Dr. Ramsey, thank you for sparing some time to come onto this podcast and uh, share your insights and um, knowledge uh, of this fascinating field of ADHD. Um, yeah, it's, it's really great. And um, I'm sure our listeners have taken quite a few things that you've said there um, and they can also reach out to you if they need to, um, contact you for about anything or get some advice as you said on your website they can get some resources over right. there as well and uh, a contact form on the website too that you can reach out to me too perfect amazing good to see you and uh, yeah look forward to, to seeing see you, you person to person absolutely exactly go well enjoy the rest of your day speak to you soon you too bye-bye take care uh,